Thank you so much for leading us in song. You know, songs have so much more meaning when you know a little bit of the backdrop of the, uh, of the, of the guy that wrote the song. That's Stephen Curtis Chapman, and a lot of you may know that he lost one of his daughters. Um, tragic accident at home, they lost one of their adopted daughters, and then he wrote this song, that we still belong to you. That's a brother that's persevering in his faith. Um, it's so good to be with you this morning. I'm so thankful, Pastor Ricky, for the opportunity. I'm going to have my wife and my two kids back in the preschool right now and, and the one on the way. Thank you so much for this opportunity and very thankful to Tim and Kelly Singletary and, and their two daughters that are over on the other side of the lake with us. Um, their daughter, Lauren, lives in the neighborhood where the church is and then their daughter, uh, Jessica, is on staff with us um, at, at Edgewater Baptist Church. And so very thankful to them and for the, the daughters that God has blessed them with. Well, I want to invite you this morning to open your Bibles to Psalm. 67. Psalm 67 this morning is where we're going to be. And I just want to communicate with you this morning that I truly sense that, that this morning is set apart. That it truly is a holy moment for this church. You have devoted yourself over this past week to seeking God's face. And so learning and pondering the Great Commission and what it means for this local body and what it means to have a global impact with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Global, to the ends of the earth, to the hard places represented by this black flag. And this week that you spent was not the first week that a group of people have gathered together to seriously consider the world and its need of the gospel and what it is that God is leading us to do as his people. Because in the summer of August 1806, on a Saturday afternoon, five young men from Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts, met together to pray, to pray near a grove of maple trees. And as they gathered to pray near their campus, a thunderstorm rolled in. Lightning overhead, rain, it forced the students to take shelter under a haystack. And as the storm raged and the lightning flashed overhead, the students prayed that God, that God would send them across the seas to share the good news of Jesus Christ with a lost world. And can I just tell you, that God heard their prayers. That you gathered last week here in America is a testimony to the fact that God answered their prayers 200 years ago. Because what God began with just five guys gathered in a field under a haystack during a storm began what was called or is called the modern missions movement where thousands and thousands and thousands of missionaries have been sent from these United States to the ends of the earth. Something that continues today. The Haystack Prayer Meeting, that's what it's called, continues to have a ripple effect. And I don't know about you, First Baptist Slidell, but I want to be part of something so big so sustained by God, so obviously directed by his hand that 200 years from now, only he gets the credit for it. I want to be part of what God is doing in the world. And I look around and I see these flags hanging and I hope that they are indicative of your heart to see God do something with a small town outside of New Orleans with a church that many people have not heard of, that God would begin doing something here this morning, this morning in this place by the movement of his spirit through the preaching of his word. That's a global impact church, not just a conference, a global impact church. And that is what God desires for every one of his churches, the local congregations to be. A global impact church. So how do we get there? How do we stay that course of having a global impact with this gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth? Well, Psalm 67 makes it clear. 
So I invite you to stand with me for the reading of God's good and holy and precious and life-giving word. As we read from Psalm 67, beginning in verse 1, may God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, Selah, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity, and you guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all, let all the ends of the earth fear him. God, this is our prayer this morning. We come before you needy. We need your word. We need your spirit this morning. We need you to speak to us. God, we need you. And we need you to send us, God, because we will not go otherwise. And if we do, it will only be in vain if we go on our own. We must have you. We must have you. And they must have you. So be glorified now through the preaching of your word. In Christ's name, amen. You can be seated. How do you stay the course of being a global impact church? Psalm 67 makes very clear through the four parts of this passage that you must keep asking for his blessing. Second, you must keep his blessing married to the purpose of his blessing. Third, you must keep praying for and going to the nations. And fourth, you must keep the hope. Keep asking for the blessing. If you're taking notes this morning, that's the first section. That's the first verse. Keep asking for his blessing. Psalm, one, Psalm 67 verse 1 May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. Let me ask you a question. How often are you as a church, a local church, gathered together asking God to be gracious to you, to give you what you don't deserve, to pour out his undeserved love on you as a church? How often are you gathering together to say, God, please bless us. Bless us, Lord. We will be cursed without your blessing. But if you would bless us, God, we should be blessed among all people. And how often are you asking him to make his face to shine upon you? That's language that's been lost today. We don't say that much anymore. But yet what we see here in Psalm 67 is a man crying out on behalf of the people of God, saying, God, make your face to shine upon us. I'm convinced that we rarely gather as the church to beg for God's grace, to plead with him for his blessing, to ask and ask and ask again for him to make his face to shine upon us because we fail to realize how pitiful we are. We don't realize how weak we are. It is difficult to find a man today who will declare boldly and freely, I am a bankrupt man apart from the grace of God. Where is the man today who declares like Paul, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am the foremost? Where is the man like Paul who says of his bloodline, who says of his pedigree, who says of his educational accomplishments, of his piety and his zeal, of all of his things that he hangs on this wall, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. Where is the man like Isaiah, whom we've spoken of and sung of today, who beholds the glory of God revealed in Christ, declaring, woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king 
the Lord of hosts. Paul and Isaiah. Paul and Isaiah. These are some of the godliest men that have ever walked the earth. And yet each is found declaring again and again that they are nothing. They are nothing apart from their God. Each of us can look and see these men saying that they are small and pitiful. Each standing as spiritual giants in our eyes only to speak before God, I am poor and needy. I remember the first associational meeting that I went to over in New Orleans. I had just begun pastoring Edgewater. This was about five years ago. And we had to gather around at the tables with other pastors and to spend some time praying for one another. And obviously it's the new, the new guy. I was 27 years old, the young guy in the room, all these things. Of course, I find myself at the table with the most seasoned pastors. These guys that I look up to and all these things. And you know how it is. Sometimes when you get in small clusters and you have to pray, if you know that, you know, there's not a lot of maturity to you in comparison to these other people, you can only do a couple of things. One, you can just give the long pause and then just say, what else can I say, God? Thank you. And just close it out that way. Or you can do the, God, what they said. I second what they said, amen. But I'll never forget, I was sitting at the table with Pastor David Crosby, pastor of First Baptist Church in New Orleans. A man I respect, a humble man. And we've gone around and some really long, elegant prayers have been uttered. Meaningful, no, no less meaningful and genuine from these other pastors. But this man whom I respect and labor with in the city, with his genuine and as humble a voice as I've heard from, from any man, says, God, it is embarrassing how poor and pitiful I am. Brothers and sisters, Dr. Crosby over at First Baptist represents an empty vessel ready to be filled. If you're a vessel full of yourself, then that leaves little room for the Spirit of God to move and to work and to be put on display in full splendor. And apart from the work of the Spirit, you cannot be a global impact church. It's not the way it works. You may travel the globe. You may be able to pull out a world map and say, we've been to every country in the world. But only God in and through you can transform lives and set the prisoner free and bring back the years the locusts have eaten. Only God can do that. But when I say that we should never stop asking for his blessing, what comes to our minds? Well, for some of us, we place an equal sign between money and blessings. In other words, to ask God to bless us means we're really asking God for more money. Certainly, to, to be blessed in the scriptures at times includes financial prosperity. You look at Solomon, a man of wisdom. He was also the wealthiest man, perhaps, that's ever walked the face of the planet. Blessed by the Lord with those treasures. But we have also seen in the scriptures a man like Judas, who struggled with greed. Even though he was right there with Jesus, he was on the mission trips. He was seized with greed and a love for money. Others of us equate blessings with health and security. In other words, we put that equal sign in between blessing and being protected, kept safe, wellness, never getting sick. And again, certainly protection and health are given at times from God. And we look throughout the scriptures and we see those blessings at times of protection. But then we look at his son. And we do not see protection on the day of the cross. Instead, we see a death. We see a death, but as we'll see in a moment, we also see a resurrection. But even more important than discerning, so what is a blessing from God and what is not is the question, what blessing from God ought I desire above all others? God's able to bless me and I can ask for any number of things, 
But what is the blessing that God most desires to give you and I? And what is the blessing that we most ought to be seeking? Well, God's word makes clear from the beginning to the end that the greatest blessing God can give is himself. He can do no better. He can give you nothing more lovely, nothing more lasting, nothing more beneficial. To give you himself is giving you the best blessing, the best gift, the best of anything that can be given to a person. And do you want to know what he's done for you? He has given you himself. He's given you the greatest blessing. But I promise you, I promise you, just as we speak, if vessels that can contain things, you're not holding all of God that you can. There's a lot more God than there is vessel. And so what we need to be busy about and asking God to bless us is to expand more and more. God, expand our ability to hold you, to receive you, to have you within us. But what is the secret there? The secret there is being poured out. Is being poured out. Paul makes clear. But some of you may find yourself struggling. Well, I, don't, I don't know if I want more God. I kind of struggle with that. I don't really know. Maybe you're, maybe you're more of the philosophical type. And you're kind of processing it more from philosophical. I don't, you know, I don't know if I actually you know, desire more God on, on that level or, you know, I've already, or maybe some of you are looking at your calendars and saying, well, my, my schedule's already so trapped. You know, I, I don't know that I have time for more God events and, and all these things. Well, in our home, if you ask my daughter if she wants to get donuts, it's a rhetorical question. She never has to think about it. The answer is never no. I could pose the question, do you want donuts at any hour of any day? I could wake her up in the night and ask her this. And she would come from her slumber and say, yes, yes, yes. Family of God, we either want to know the Father more and more or we don't. It's as clean cut as do you want a donut or not? We either want to know the Son of God at a deeper and deeper level or we don't. We either want to be filled more and more with that sweet, sweet spirit of God or we don't. Your answer to that question is either yes, yes, yes or no, no, no. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you can ride some middle line. You either want him or you don't. The language here in verse one, for God's face to shine upon us means he is close and he is near. This same language is used of Moses when it's communicating that they spoke, God spoke with Moses face to face as a friend speaks to a friend. That's what that expression means. To cause his face to shine upon you means he has come in very close. He is having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with you, with you as a church. Oh, that God would cause his face to shine upon First Baptist Sledell. But why? The reality is that we often are in the business of asking for blessings in our country. We're a little bit of an entitled people. Our government reveals this on multiple levels. I mean, things have kind of gone really bad in our nation because we are so entitled and we don't have any problem holding out our hands a lot of times. But before we for a second think, well, I've already received enough from the Lord. Don't you forget, don't ever forget that you are always poor, genuinely poor and genuinely needy before him. And he is pleased, he is pleased to give you himself. But he always does it with a greater purpose in mind. And what is that purpose? Well, look at verse two, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. To be a global impact church, keep asking for his blessing. And then second, keep his blessing married to the, to the purpose of his blessing. I, I love marriage. I've been married to my wife for 10 years. And I thank God for marriage. But I know that it's un, under assault in our nation especially. And so I use those terms marriage there because we know that you have to fight to do that. 
If, if all of the statistics are right, then most marriages in our country are likely to fail. If not in the first few years, some even 20, 30, 40 years down the road. When people just throw in the towel and quit. And so when we use the term marriage today, we know that it's going to take work and effort on our part. And I promise you, it is going to take intentional work on your part as a church to keep God's blessing married to the purpose of his blessing. It will not happen on its own. You will have to labor. You will have to be intentional. You have to keep coming back and asking yourself, are we hoarding the blessings of God? Or are they being poured into us in order that his ways may be known on the earth? You see, we see this pattern in Scripture over and over again. Earlier, I quoted some passages from Paul and Isaiah. I just want you to hear the verses that immediately follow those verses that I quoted. Paul, right after he says in 1 Timothy 1.15, Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. In verse 16, the very next verse, listen to what he says. Because I received, but I received mercy for this reason. Okay, so there's a reason. He, he's received grace, this chief sinner, for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Paul is saying, I was blessed with this incredible saving love in order that Jesus Christ might display his patience to all nations. Paul is saying, I was blessed to be a blessing. Consider Isaiah. After Isaiah admits his uncleanliness in chapter 6, verse 5, we read in verse 8, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send? Who will go for us? And then I said, Here am I, send me. Isaiah's guilt has just been taken away. His sin atoned for in verse 7. And immediately in verse 8, he is saying, Send me. I will go and tell the people. Isaiah experienced God's grace and now he wants to carry that grace to all others. He was blessed to be a blessing. How many of you have ever received a birthday card with money in it? Anybody? When I was young, we used to get birthday cards from my Aunt Janine. And one thing that she did, how we knew it was always Aunt Janine's birthday card, was there was a check paper clipped inside the the, the birthday card. That was her gift, some spending money. Now, you didn't even have to open the envelope to know that it was from Aunt Janine because the rollers and the machines that processed the mail, they had basically embossed the, the imprint of that paper clip, you know, on the envelope. You could feel it, you knew what it was, and you knew what it represented. Birthday money. But what if the mailman decided that every time he knew that there was a card with money inside of it, he would keep that one. He was fine delivering messages, but not money. What if every year when he felt that paper clip, instead of it compelling him to deliver that letter with joy, knowing that it was my birthday, it incited him towards greed. You would be outraged, right? Yet we are male men and male women in this room today. And the one who is most outraged at our hoarding this treasure is the sender. The one who has entrusted to us this incredible treasure in our hands and in our hearts to now deliver it to those without him and without hope in this world. Can I just tell you that the happiest male men in the world today are the ones that know they're delivering good news. The ones that know they are delivering a needed package. The ones who know that what is inside of that envelope in their hand is the source of great joy for the recipient. They find the most fulfillment in their job. And can I just tell you that it's those who just go about it mindlessly, who never think about the joy contained, who never think about the people who are desiring the letters, who, who maybe dream about what's in the package, who, who never go to the difficult places, they're the ones who just live this life and then die. And not much happened from the time they were born to when they passed. They just delivered mail. Brothers and sisters, we are invited to do it with joy, knowing that what is within this message called the gospel is life-saving. It is needed urgently. 
people, when they receive it, they respond with the greatest joy you've ever seen. It will bring tears to your eyes. And so I'm inviting you. God's word is inviting you to deliver the good news with joy. Brothers and sisters, his word says in Romans 10, how will they call on him and who they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him of who they never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? And as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Therefore, to be a global impact church, you keep asking for his blessing. And you keep his blessing married to the purpose of his blessing. But then thirdly, you keep praying and going to the nations. You keep praying and going to the nations. God's word says in verse three, let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy for, the, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. This is a prayer. This is a prayer, but it is a prayer that requires active participation. I want you to think for me with a sec- for a second, back to, in your Bible to James, the letter of James. He tells us, the church in James, that caring for one another is very logical. For example, if I tell someone that I know has no jacket to go out into the freezing cold and I say to them, brother, I'm praying that you're gonna stay warm. What good is that? No, if I see my brother's knee for a jacket when it's cold and then I say the words to him, this prayer, brother, I'm praying that you stay warm, but I don't do anything to help get him a jacket, then it's essentially an insensitive insult. It'd been better if I just kept my mouth shut. God expects me, if I can, to do something about making my brother's jacket and his need for a jacket met. And that only makes sense. The same is true here in this passage. How ridiculous would it be for us today to say, God, bless the nations. Let them be glad in you, knowing that billions have never even heard the name of Jesus. How are they going to rejoice in the one in whom they've not heard? That's what Paul's saying. How can we pray this prayer and then do nothing to bring about the actual fulfillment of the prayer? Putting the name of Jesus out there so that they can rejoice in him. Essentially, by the cross of God, by the cross of Christ, God is saying to us today, I have made a way for them to praise me. By the cross, I have have made a way for the people of all nations to worship me and I've placed it in your hands I've given it to you I've entrusted it to you that's my blessing it's me now go and tell now go and tell 200 years ago when Adoniram Judson set sail for Southeast Asia he knew that he would likely never see his family again. He knew that he could likely die at sea on the voyage. He knew that he would likely contract a disease, probably one that would take his life and did the life of his children. He knew that even when he got there and shared the gospel, those people might reject him and even kill him. And yet counting the cost he went Today, we can reach, listen to this, we can reach the same destination that took Adnair and Judson three months to get to in 30 hours. And not only that, a man or a woman is going to bring us meals and Cokes and snacks while we watch TV and listen to music. Brothers and sisters, I see these advancements in technology and in travel as guns in the hands of God's people. Listen to this. You see, a gun is a very powerful tool. And it's dangerous if used foolishly. In fact, it's so dangerous that it can take your life. But if you use it wisely, then you can take down a buck from 100 yards away and feed your family for a month. It's all about what you're doing with that 
thing that's been placed within your hands. Let us take these advancements, airplanes, and use them for God's glory to get to the hard places and get there in a hurry. Short-term mission trips are something relatively new because you couldn't go on a short-term mission trip to Asia when it took you three months to get there and three months to get back. That wasn't short-term. A lot of us would consider that a move. But yet today, in the course of only 10 to 14 days, you can go from here to there, labor, and then be back and try to recover from the jet lag and be back at the office by Monday. Incredible advancements in technology. These little things right here. Most of you have one in your purse or in your pocket right now. Don't let these little devices distract you from God's purpose in this world. They will consume you. Just living your life right here. Instead, use this and put it on the altar before God. And say, God, how can you use this to cultivate within me a love for the people of all nations? And I'll go ahead and tell you, there's apps on these little things. They can teach you about the nations. They can help guide you in praying for the nations. And you can buy plane tickets to Asia right here. Use them for God's glory. He is worthy of the praise of all people at all times. Don't use them to gratify the flesh. Use them to glorify God. Take these advancements and use them for his glory, for his kingdom to come, for his will to be done right here as it is in heaven. I don't know about you, but something that is out of sight is often and very quickly out of mind for me. The billions who have never heard the name of Jesus, they are out of my sight, but they are never out of the sight of our Father. They are out of my mind many times, but they are never out of the mind of God our Father. They are without God in the world, so we must not cease to labor until they have heard. Praying and going. It's like two handles on an old plow. If you push too hard on one, you'll mess up your field. But if you hold both in good tension, you're likely looking at a good harvest. Praying and going. You know, harvest comes when that which was placed in the ground springs up and bears fruit. That is the hope of planting seeds, right? You don't plant seeds because you hope that the ground fills up or you're trying to elevate a, a, a piece of property. Now you, you put seeds in the ground because you're looking forward to the day that that which was planted will spring up and you'll receive a harvest from it. Brothers and sisters, we need, if we hope to be a global impact church, to remember why we are laboring in the fields why we are sowing seeds. We need to rekindle the hope, not a hope, not some ambiguous secular hope that, man, things will be better one day. The hope, the hope that is ours as believers in Jesus Christ. We need to continue to labor diligently and keep at all times the hope of the resurrection in full view. Look at verses six and seven. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let the ends of the earth fear him. It's likely that this psalm, Psalm 67, is a, is a harvest time psalm. In other words, they have been sowing seeds and, and now the harvest is coming and they are giving thanks to God for the blessing of provision. How much more so us, the children of God, who understand now, who, who have the full scriptures in our hands, who know that Paul says it's not who plants that matters. It's not who waters that matters. It's God alone who makes things grow. He gets the credit. And then we have Jesus calling us to sow seeds and telling us that we are these different soils and these different seeds and these different kinds of plants. We understand that the work done out in the field, these things that they're giving thanks for were only a shadow. They're basically a symbol or a sign pointing us to something greater to a harvest one day that is coming. On the day, on the harvest day, the return of Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the day that you and I have to look forward. 
And we will only labor as diligently in his harvest fields as we know that we have the promise of the resurrection that is coming to us on the day of his return. If you don't believe in that, you're going to limit your work right now. The more you look forward to his return, the more you will live for his return today. The less you think about his return, the less you will live for his return. And brothers and sisters, there's no better way to live and to, and to think about his return than to labor in his harvest fields. Because one day the dead in Christ shall rise. I mean, has it ever struck you that in God's word, when Paul is encouraging the church in Thessalonica over deaths, over those who have fallen asleep, he says, what he does is he doesn't say, oh, it's okay. They're in heaven. Don't worry about it. Now, what does he tell them? He says, they have fallen asleep, but one day the dead in Christ shall rise and we will meet them in the air. And he goes on to describe in great detail that that's what we're looking forward to. You don't need to worry about them. They've fallen asleep. That's what he says right there. In other words, they're there now, but that's not their final resting place. One day they're coming back, back out of the grave. That which was sown in death and faithfulness to Christ, one day is going to yield a harvest. And all those faithful in Christ shall rise to meet him in the air. Brothers and sisters, we have lost the hope of the resurrection. Rarely do I ever have a conversation with a friend. Rarely can I be found in my own home talking about the resurrection as though that's somehow important. But yet when we see Paul orienting the churches to what's important, he says that's what we keep our eyes on. That's what we're looking forward to. And those faithful martyrs, the hundreds of thousands who are dying in our world today, represented by this black flag in those places, the hard places, they are keeping their eyes on that reality and it allows them to be faithful to the end. We've lost sight. We've lost our hope. And so what we need is right where we began today is to come before God and say, God, we are poor and needy. We are like blind people just groping around in this Christian life trying to figure out what to do. God, we need you to open our eyes again. We need salve for our eyes so that we can see. So that we can see your son. The writer of Hebrews says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. Why? Why? so that you can run the race marked out for you. And before you start thinking in individualistic terms, it's all plural right there in the, in the original. Y'all, good old Southern y'all. Y'all fix your eyes on Jesus so that you can run y'all's race together. First Baptist slide out, link arms together. It's going to look a little different for each person's part, but everybody has a part in this thing. That's the beauty of a body. It comes together. This hand will never be able to accomplish what this foot can do. And my knees will never behold the things my eyes do. But without this knee bending, I'm not going to see the great things that I've seen. We've got to recover the resurrection. I close with this story. My wife and I had the opportunity to do international missions on a short-term mission trip to East Asia. So, um, yeah, in East Asia, uh, there uh, are these huge cities. And so we're there and we get dropped off in this smaller area and we have no one to translate for us, nothing. We're there with a couple of other believers and we're just supposed to go out and seek people of peace. That's our agenda for the week. There you go. Here's a little bit of money. We'll see y'all in a week. Go and make disciples of all nations. And so we go out and we begin trying to find anybody that can speak English. We find some people and God begins to open these incredible doors for us to begin to make disciples of all nations. In fact, one of the guys that we met, he kind of became our guide and he ended up being an English teacher in the school. Basically, the way that they do elementary and middle school is the kids move there and they live at school six days a week. And then they go home for one day a week. And then they go back and they're there. They live there, everything. It's kind of like college except for middle school and high school students. And so he was the teacher of the English class. And he said, would you be willing to come and speak to my English class? We said, absolutely. So we go, speaking the only language we know how to speak, English. 
And we go in there and we begin to share with him. He says, well, there's, there's four other English classes. Can we divide you up? And so in the course of only about a half an hour, we were able to share about Christmas. They wanted to know about American holidays. So we said, Christmas, it's when God gave his one and only son. And then Easter. Let me tell you about Easter. It's when God's one and only son died on the cross for our sins. And so we began to share with them these, these holidays and stuff. And then later on that day, we had the chance to be alone with this teacher again. And I was laboring. I was laboring in broken English to try to communicate this story. He was an atheist, didn't believe that there was any God. And so he was listening to this story and was just like, oh, you know, making these big facial expressions and stuff. And I was like, and he, and he finally, I get it. And he says, I, I, he, and he died, he died on the cross for the things that you've done against God. And he said, oh, you know, he's just kind of nodding and listening. And I, and I stopped. Thank God my wife was with me in the back car. And she was like, and, and the resurrection. <laughs> it wasn't that I'd forgotten, but I had lost sight. And brothers and sisters, we have lost sight. And it's not that I didn't believe in the resurrection. It's not that I don't believe that God truly raised Jesus from the grave. And exactly what Paul says in Ephesians 2, that he didn't really raise me up with Christ. That same powerful arm that worked on Jesus worked on me. It wasn't that I didn't believe it. But indicative in my gospel presentation of forgetting and getting to that part and leaving it out, I feel like is indicative of our ministry many times in the church today. We forget what we're living for. We are looking forward to the day of his return. We are not just looking forward to going to heaven. That is not what the biblical call is for us to look forward to. We are looking forward to the day of Christ's return. That is the day when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what I'm living for. And if we want to be a global impact church, then we've got to come back to that place that one day everybody's headed where we kneel before him and we say we are poor and needy. Fix our eyes again on the hope that is ours in Christ, the resurrection. Send us, God. Please, God, put it in our hearts. Send us wherever you would have us go. Father, here we are. I can think of no better response today than to invite you to come and to kneel before our God, our maker, and to just declare to him, we are needy. Starts there, doesn't it, in Psalm 67, verse 1, with an admittance of need. And I trust that as God then pours out his blessings on you, that you will be poured out to the ends of the earth, that one day, that one day there will be many who will look back even hundreds of years from now and will say something started there. Something started there when they got down on their knees, just like those five guys got down on their knees under a haystack in the middle of a storm and they said, God send us. You come now as, as God leads you this morning. Father, I pray for this church that in these next moments of worship, God, you would be glorified. Father, there's nothing we can bring. We can't bring anything to you, God. We only show up poor and needy. And so God, in these next few moments, would you simply bless us, please? God, we come with nothing that we can do, nothing that we can give, we need. And so, Father, cause your face to shine upon this church. Start something here and now because a group of believers got together and huddled up next to one another and they said, send us. We pray this all for your glory.